Architects like uh, Noble Stone Street Hoffer became established at that time because they were, there was work for them. And we see this again and again successively. Architects came in when there was work and left when there wasn't and things haven't changed much today. Uh, but just to introduce the idea of how important it is to uh, develop research profiles on buildings. For example, this, this article about Hoffer begins to talk about some of his buildings that we can now trace and, and um, attribute to him because of articles like this, uh, one of which is the Colonial or now known as the Yale Hotel on Granville. Here's a couple of buildings Hoffer did in one photograph. Uh, the extension to Vancouver's courthouse, which is now gone, which is Victory Square. One of J.W. Horne's blocks uh, on, I guess that is, Canby Street. So again, as these successive waves of prosperity hit, building sites would be redeveloped, sometimes leaving original buildings, sometimes not. We'll talk about this building later today and, and the restoration that's going on in this building. This was one of the premier buildings built um, during the Klondike era in Vancouver. And this typifies the kind of heavy, rusticated masonry construction we see from the late 1890s. This is the flak block right across from um, Kitty Corner from Victory Square and across the street from the Dominion Building at Camby and Hastings. This building was designed by William Blackmore for Thomas Flack, who actually made money in the Klondike, one of the few came back to Vancouver with a whole bunch of money and decided to build uh, his monument, the Flack Block, uh, which also served for Klondike outfitting at the time. However, by 1900, the time this building was finished, the boom was starting to go off the Klondike Gold Rush. This is an 1898 bird's eye map of Vancouver and you can see here the buildings in red or the masonry buildings are concentrated around the harbor, uh, down you can actually see down Granville Street here. There's the original Granville Street Bridge built in uh, 1888. Uh, and there was a series of buildings up Granville. And it's interesting to look at the pattern of downtown, which was very much established by the CPR to promote their real estate. Uh, they wanted uh, to develop down here, their holdings down by the harbor. But they also wanted to build, uh, to draw people up Granville Street towards Granville in Georgia, which is where they built the original Vancouver Hotel. Uh, and the idea was that their commercial property along Granville would become worth more if other people would build. So they seeded in a number of buildings that kind of set the tone, as it were, for the type of development that they wanted to see. Canada was promoted as the last best west, the, one of the last best places you could uh, move if you were leaving uh, England or Europe. This was a great opportunity because they would probably in the situation they were in, they would never own land. But what also was driving this great boom? Why was the, the west of Canada and the United States booming at this time period? Then there's really one explanation, what is called the Big Ditch, the Panama Canal, and the speculation that began to occur around that, the largest construction project ever undertaken in history to that time, uh, to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans with a canal so that you wouldn't have to go all the way around South America to get up the West Coast. Phenomenally important project. The French had tried it. It had failed because of the difficult conditions. Theodore Roosevelt, as President of the United States, put his personal prestige into making this project work. And uh, he was a very popular American president, and he felt the single greatest thing he could do for the West of his country was to get this canal built. So he personally went down to Panama. This is phenomenal when you think of the time period now, over 100 years ago. It was like this huge media event where TR went down to Panama, was mobbed by crowds, sat on cranes and bulldozers in his white suits there, and personally kind of put his prestige behind getting this project going, reactivating it, getting this construction underway, allowing it to proceed. And there was so much speculation worldwide about the impact that this would have throughout 1906 when this was starting to 1912 when it reached fever pitch and then global events really intervened before the canal could be finished. And it didn't actually open until 1914, a little too late for us. 
But during this time period, what was happening was there was such intense speculation and so much investment occurring, mostly from England. Um, and we had the resources in BC. But here's the size of timbers being, being sent out from BC. We had first growth lumber size, 18 inches by 18 inches by 70 feet. You know, sort of the length that you could ship out on the railway. Phenomenal. For all you had to do was go cut it down. And so our, our minerals, our fish, and our lumber were driving our economy. We had the biggest lumber mills and sawmills in the world. We had the biggest canneries in the world at this time period. So you can imagine what that was doing to our local economy. As it was once said, a tree couldn't fall in the forest without it being heard on Hastings Street because the impact was there. So businesses were developing. Here's actually a view of what the waterfront looked like at BC Mills. This is uh, about a 1912 shot. You can see we're still uh, using sailing ships, and a lot of them. Uh, they, were, they were loading up with lumber, but they were coming in with other goods as ballast. So they were coming in with terracotta and plate glass and different manufactured goods um, from England and other places, unloading and then picking up our lumber and taking it away. So this is the size of the BC Mills operation at the time, just an enormous, enormous mill. One of the things that we'll talk about later and one of the things I, I ins insist on being so important to when we talk about heritage is, is its context. Why was it built? Why was it built the way it was? Why, why did anybody care enough to do this? And somebody cared enough to build a very sophisticated and elegant building as a showpiece to show the company's products. And not only the company's products, but this modular prefabricated system one of the issues they had as a mill was as they were cutting the milled lumber, they would often end up with something too short to be usable, less than eight feet or so. So they would have piles and piles and piles of this short mill run lumber, which they either had to burn or somehow get rid of, and somebody came up with the bright idea, well, if you've got all these short pieces of lumber, why don't we just assemble them into panels and sell the panels? as a prefabricated system. So this is what was developed in 1904 was this modular panel eight feet high, three feet, between three and four feet wide that could be bolted together. And they're characterized by these vertical battens that then cover the joints. This is the typical BC Mills Timber and Trading Company prefab. So here again is our building and this gives us some clues about the original appearance. The building is actually surprisingly intact to its original construction of over a hundred years ago. And there are the original plans for the building. And again we'll talk in a minute about the idea of the um, classical revival style really influencing now the look of buildings locally after the turn of the 19th century. The use of classical columns and the symmetry of the building is very much of its time period, which is not that dissimilar from other buildings being designed in 1906. Uh, the Vancouver Courthouse, now the Art Gallery, uh, really indicates the type of um, monumentality and the way that the new city saw itself. Now, bear in mind that Vancouver had burned to the ground in 1886. Here we are. This building was designed in 1906. That's a pretty big leap in 20 years from a frontier settlement to a city that really sees itself now as a great city on the Pacific. And uh, Vancouver was actually billing itself as uh, Canada's Liverpool. That's how we saw ourselves. We weren't ever going to be London, but we were certainly going to be a large, major, industrial, working class city. Um, but we were going to be wealthy. And that was the kind of vision, the strength that, uh, that the Edwardian era really brought to Vancouver. This was designed by Francis Rattenbury, who also designed the uh, legislative buildings in Victoria. 